Please give him a hand. Thank you. I want to thank everybody for coming out this early. Um, believe it or not, it's really hard to give a speech in 20 minutes. I'm used to doing much longer presentations. Indeed, this presentation was originally about 90 minutes long when I gave it in Amsterdam. Um, by way of a brief introduction, um, I uh, wrote this book about 10 years ago. It's had several revisions, required reading at about 50 schools, and then recently came out with this one last year. Both are for sale downstairs, and I'll be doing an author's um, signing uh, shortly after this. So let's get started. Um, I'd like you all to imagine a world without search or without a social media. Um, what would that feel like? How would you find uh, restaurants, friends, facts? We become pretty dependent upon this technology. What if, um, what if it all went away? What if it was taken away from you? What if um, Google went out of business? or Facebook was shut down, or if their stock dropped to $60 a share from 600 How many own Google stock? That's all right. I don't own any. What if all the personal information you shared with all these companies was now going to the highest or even lowest bidder? Now, think all this is crazy or paranoid, because it really isn't, but the important question is, as music professionals, are you helping the wrong side win in this war for digital music dollars? Show of hands, who has a... Google-operated, Android-based phone or device. Interesting. Okay. How many of you are aware that uh, Google was recently fined $500 million by the Department of Justice for drug trafficking? Really? Now, all the people whose hands were up a moment ago at Google Phones now have put their hands down. So that is kind of interesting. Did you know that um, Google has been uh, cited? Let me see. I can't read my own writing here. Um, for a Fourth Amendment violations for infringing on Safari. So when you were using Safari, Google was kind of peeking in on you a little bit. Um, that Google has, be, has reneged on uh, numerous uh, settlements with the Federal Trade Commission. Anybody know that? No? Okay. And that Google might be illegal in over 50 countries very soon. So how did all this kind of happen? How did we go from the beautiful, free, easy Internet to uh, this you know, maze of litigation we're dealing with right now. What were the humble beginnings? Well, the Internet started out pretty much just like this. Only instead of two tin cans, it's hundreds of computers. And instead of a string, it's some kind of fiber optic cable. But basically, ISPs who provide the connection between two computers claim we're just like that piece of rope. We're basically like a dumb pipe, like a water pipe that travels underneath uh, your sewer or underneath your, uh, your house. And we don't know if the water is clean or if the water is toxic, that's not really our business. We're dumb pipes. To us, an email looks just like an MP3. Data is data is data. Now, they use this, uh, this dumb pipe analogy to, um, to mitigate their responsibility when it comes to copyright infringement. They say, hey, you know, we're just, we're just shuttling information. And that's probably true. But other companies, which I'll call web-based services, what they do is they take this same idea of non-responsibility, and they shift into their business model. And you know some of these companies right here. Google is by far the worst offender of all of these. So, and I'm, by the way, for this presentation, I'm grouping all of these, and I'm calling them all ISPs, even though legally they're not all ISPs, but browsers, web service providers, web-based services, search engines, I'm calling them all ISPs for this demonstration because they all have a very similar agenda, and that's to provide you with a, an easy, uh, you know, beautiful, intelligent experience of, of getting information off the Internet, billions and billions of bits of terabytes of information, all for the price of coffee, one cup of coffee a day. It sounds like a, uh, a beautiful Star Trek paradise, but have you read the fine print? Is there a catch? Now, of you people on Google phones, you'll be familiar with this document. Uh, this is the Google Terms of Service Agreement. Let's read it together. Uh, I don't think we're going to have time to read that. But, you know, you did read this before you signed and clicked it, didn't you? Show of hands of everyone who's read the entire Google Terms of Service Agreement. And those same people have Google phones, and I'm betting Gmail accounts and use YouTube as well. Well, let's look at what you actually agreed to. This is uh, my Gmail account, which I've now gotten rid of. And this is an actual email that my daughter typed to, to a friend of hers. A 12, my daughter's 12 years old. And this is a relatively benign email. It should come up any second. Come on. There we go. 
This is a normal email that one 12-year-old might write to another about something that happened during the day, dealing with homework, whatever. Now, this is technically her property, but the minute she clicks send, Google now owns that email. And they farm it and tag words in it and create a profile. And very quickly, uh, you know, ads start showing up that are relevant to the information that's in the email. This is called targeted advertising. Now, personally, I don't have a big problem with this. I actually like targeted advertising. It uh, saves me the trouble of doing a lot of shopping. But here's another way to examine this same email. Yes. This is a very different profile, isn't it? And my 12-year-old daughter, when she's 20, might buy a plane ticket to Israel and find she's on a watch group. Or, because it's my email account and my computer, I might find myself on a watch group. This new information, when you park yourself for more than 15 minutes, Google geotags you. You cannot turn this off on your phone. And they, uh, they take note of which places you go to. So let's take a look at how much information you give up each and every day. Your uh, current location, every place your phone has been, the numbers you dialed, names in your contact book, their Facebook and Twitter accounts, credit card information, their Gmail accounts, and lots and lots of more information, all of which becomes ISP property. Pardon me while I catch up with myself. <clears throat> also, when you use uh, Facebook games, when you use large retailers like Amazon and eBay and all the mobile apps that you think are free, like uh, Maps, like um, um, free games, stock trackers, photo galleries, flight trackers, Yelp, all these are garnishing, inf uh, gathering information on you, uh, your location, your habits, everything, and it's all being sold. And this is what is called the freemium model. This is the freemium ecosystem. Now, as I said earlier, I don't have a big problem with all this as long as it's just being used for advertising. But the bigger problem, and this, by the way, is worth about $100 billion a year, just in case you want to know what your free information is worth, the information you're giving up, about $100 billion a year to combined ISPs. The bigger problem comes what happens um, when these, if and when these companies become desperate for money or subpoenaed by the government. Um, and as you're about to see, all, of these, all three of these things are about to happen relatively soon. This is um, an actual page from Google, and this is how Google makes their money. They charge for words. So if you want to use a word like free, you're going to pay a lot more for it than you would a word like elephant, because free is a good word to use in advertising. So something like buy Viagra at a deep discount and get a free subscription can cost an advertiser hundreds of dollars each time a visitor uh, clicks on that impression, and uh, especially if it's ranked towards the top of the page. As you can see, uh, dumb pipes are not so dumb after all, uh, until they get caught. And get caught they did. In this particular case, the Department of Justice figured out that these sites at the ranking here are all Canadian pharmacies, which are not licensed in the United States, and the Viagra that they were selling was bootleg Viagra. Now, this is kind of all, it's all fun and games when you're poking fun at the entertainment industry, but people actually buy the stuff and get sick and die. So the Department of Justice fined them, said, here's what I think of that. And Google was juicing these, so if you bought a lot of advertising, they would juice it in the search ranking, which kind of defeats their mission statement of it being an organic search. Clearly, it was not an organic search. So this ecosystem, oh, I'm sorry, um, let me catch up with myself. Okay, so this, this creates an interesting ecosystem. It creates an ecosystem based not on the value of a physical thing that might be manufactured, which has done a great investment of investment in labor and marketing, but rather on the ability to provide mere access to that same manufactured thing, as well as harvesting the private information of those who seek it. Now, ISPs say this is all kind of good for competition, it's good for the consumer, uh, and naturally, this system has to, in order for it to survive, has to encourage people to give up more and more content at cheaper and cheaper rates, because content is what drives people to, their, to these uh, sites. Best example of this is Amazon. Amazon originally sold books and CDs. They sold them at below cost to drive out their competition, and drive out their competition they did. We all know this. If you know someone who's lost their job due to downsizing, you know, to, you know the real cost of the freemium model. Now, uh, uh, next, I assume, now that Amazon is selling everything else under the sun, not just books and CDs, we can expect maybe Walmart and Kmart to start joining 
uh, the ranks of these stores. ISPs do not call this urban blight. They don't call this contributing to unemployment. They have their own technical term for it. They call it um, innovation and progress. The problem is, is there's an inner supply of new users born every day who want to use the internet, but only a finite supply of free content that they can aggregate. Now, uh, surprisingly, this converting to the walk around mall to the uh, click and surf mall has met with very little opposition. Many industries have converted easily to it travel, banking, real estate. But that's because their product isn't the free toy at the bottom of the internet cereal box. Ours is. And so it's not um, surprising that the internet, the entertainment industry, has uh, pushed back. For this system to survive, it must completely destroy br uh, brick and mortar retail. That is their mission, and we are part of that mission. Entertainment industry is pushed back because we have these inconvenient things called trademarks and copyrights and patents, and these are just big inconveniences for ISPs. They wish they would just all go away, except, of course, as it applies to the code that, that makes their program up. In their freemium ecosystem, content equals eyeballs, eyeballs equals clicks, and clicks equals money. So it's in their best interest to convince you that it's hopeless to try to sell your stuff. Just give it away. Make money on something else. Now, even though most business people know that infringement of intellectual property is wrong, that it hurts the overall economy, that the freemium model is totally unsustainable, uh, the growing number that are vested in the freemium model is so deep that they now have to keep it free and need even more free content. They're basically addicted to free. And they can't entertain any argument about legislation because that would now hurt the business model they've invested in. I call these people free tards. <laughs> if you voice a dissenting opinion, you are bullied by bloggers that are sponsored by Google. You have uh, your sites ranked low in search and you are attacked by hacktivists. The media outlets that support the internet, like Gizmodo, Wired, they of course have to toe the party line. They have to reject all forms of legislation, such as uh, SOPA. They have to toe the party line because these people are their clients. Instead, they label the entertainment industry as rich dinosaurs who won't innovate. So how do you turn an honest person, how do you make an honest person feel okay about stealing content? Well, you have to have a great message, and a great message they do have. The problem is people do respect copyrights, so we're not going to call them copyrights. We're going to call it information. And oh, most people do know that stealing is wrong, but sharing is very cool. You put all this in the ISP uh, information looking glass PR blender, and you come up with keywords that create a phenomenal message that almost nobody could disagree with. Information wants to be free and should be shared openly. This is your product they're talking about, your blood, sweat, and tears. Um, they present themselves as the, as the David and the David and Goliath scenario with entertainment companies being Goliath, but the truth is actually the opposite. Oh boy, what did I do? The truth is actually the opposite. Um, they are actually the Goliath, and we are actually the David. Um, in, uh,